Show. The Croc Super Show. Hey, it's me, Captain Cool, and the Cogs. The Croc Super Show, starring... Welcome back, citizens, to an all-new episode of the Bat Cave Podcast. It's your old bat chum, John S. Drew here, and we're back with new episodes, taking a look at our 70s favorites of Monster Squad, Filmation 77, and of course, Electra Woman and Dinah Girl. And joining me as he's been since the very beginning is the man himself, the host, or the co-host, depending on how he puts it, of the Flopcast, Mr. Kevin Eldridge. Hey, Kevin. John, great to be back in the Batcave. It's been too long. It has been too long. And I, and, and, and to you and the others, as I've been saying in my, as I like to call this also, my apology tour. <laughs> this has been too <laughs> long in, in getting back together and doing these. But uh, sometimes life sort of, as, as John Lennon would say, uh, what was the exact? Uh, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about a show that's already like 45 years old or something. So it's, it's, it's what's the rush? You know? what's the, it's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's it delayed a few months. What's an extra couple of months after 45 years? <laughs> well, I, I can say this much for, you know, I didn't realize it because we're actually almost halfway through this show, too, because there's only eight stories. Right. So this, this is number three. This is number three. And today okay. we're talking about the Empress of Evil. And, you know, as I said to you at the beginning, before we started recording here, I think this is the first time I've seen this since the original broadcast. So the ending threw me. I was actually pleasantly surprised by it. Yeah, this was a weird episode. They, they did some uh, they did some funny stuff, especially towards the end. Very yeah. interesting. They did some funny stuff. They got to work with... Uh, their new uh, special effects board as they uh-huh. played around with lightning bolts and stretching Electro Woman and Dinah <laughs> Girl and such. Yes. Um, but but not not psychedelic the way the previous episode was with, um, oh, what's his name now? Glitter Rock. Glitter Rock. Not as psychedelic, but definitely a bit of a trip with, with some of the effects they used. Yes, it's not quite as uh, disco era but it's still definitely the 70s right exactly now this episode was written by Dwayne Poole and Dick Robbins our two creators of the series actually and who wrote most of the episodes and it was directed by Walter Miller who also directed most of the episodes as I think I've mentioned previously Miller's other credits are primarily doing award specials and such like the Oscars and the Emmys uh, right. So it's interesting that he winds up doing a Saturday morning kids show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this aired October 16th and 23rd of 1976. Remember, these were two-part stories that stretched out over two weeks. And again, I got to say this, and I know I'm repeating something, but it's been a while since we've talked. I do find this interesting because it's like we're talking about a weekly series with maybe about eight minutes of content as a part. (laughs) And then it's like, hang on kids. You get the conclusion next week. Yep. Yep. That was the, yeah, the, the Croft super show anthology format. Mm -hmm. Gotta wait kids. Gotta wait. But you know, well, see, here's the thing. It worked. And yet at the same time, we only did get one season of Electra woman and Dina girl. And yet those eight episodes, you know, today, what with the revival they did, but also, and I know you talk about this on t- at times on uh, the Flopcast uh, for various TV shows and such that you talk about the merchandising, the dolls, the I-, I just saw I didn't realize this. There was a board game. 
Was there really? I don't think I remembered the board game either. What? They made a board game of everything back then. They did. They (laughs) did. And this looks kind of like looking at the contents. I saw one listing on eBay that it looks almost like a ripoff of the $6 million man game because you kind of got to collect these electric cards that look like the power cards. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think for a lot of those games where the board games just based on whatever property was, was coming up. A lot of them were not good. It was right. just we have to do a board game. It's part of the merchandising. So I know I, I have the the Monster Squad board game. I I did pick up at a, at a convention show a couple of years ago, and we tried to play it, and we thought this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. You have a gorgeous painting on, on the board itself. But so you know, so it's cool to have. It's fun to look at. But some of these old games are not so good to play. Right. Now, I, I got to ask, maybe you can tell me, because I almost pulled the trigger and put a bid in. One game, in great condition, $20. That sounds reasonable to me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's I mean, a there, good deal. There were others that were going up to 400 That's why I'm thinking $20. You know, maybe I should just do it, because I'm just too curious to see what the <laughs> gameplay is really like. Yeah, I think that's the neighborhood of what I paid for uh, the Monster Squad game. I think I paid 20 25 something like that. Okay. And that's one that there was a local uh, dealer that set up at all the local conventions here. I'm, I'm in the Boston area. And over the course of a year, every show I'd go to, I'd see this guy. I'd see the Monster Squad game. And I think, no, I'm not going to buy Monster Squad <laughs> game. I have too much junk here already. No. And then but after seeing it at like six different shows, I, okay, I give up. I'm going to buy the Monster Squad. You felt it needed a home. Yes, yes. It just needed a little love. <laughs> like Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. Exactly. That's the Monster Squad game, the Charlie Brown Christmas tree of games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, let's talk about this episode here. As I say, two parts. Part one opens. Behind the walls of this secret location is Electrobase, where Frank Heflin runs Crime Scope. The amazing computer complex that supplies Electro Woman and Dyna Girl with their amazing superpowers. Right on Electra Base, and Frank is working away. And I thought this was interesting. The opening narration, the way, you know, the narrator's doing the narration, I almost thought maybe this was the first episode written. Because there's just a lot of explanation of what's going on and who Frank is and all this right, stuff. Right. And I'm thinking, by now we know this if we're following as the kids. Right, because so they start with – this is one of the times where they start with the exterior of the house. Mm-hmm. So you're seeing, okay, here's where the Electra base is. Yeah, well, it was rather establishing for uh, episode three. That could very well be because obviously these things were not necessarily – there's not a lot of continuity from one episode to the next. So they might not have necessarily started with the first one written. Right, exactly. Yeah. We see he's working on a new attachment for the electric comps that's called Electra Split, which we'll learn about later on. He doesn't go into any details <laughs> as he's working on it there when suddenly. What? What's happening, Crime Scope? What? No, it is not your precious Crime Scope. It is I. <laughs> what are you? You'll find no hidden projector. And I'm certain you don't believe in ghosts. Then who are you? Suffice it to say that I am the Empress of Evil. And I command you to summon Electra Woman and Dinah Girl back here. And why, why do you think I do that? And when they have returned, I will have an announcement of intense interest for all of you. <laughs> You know, we saw something similar to that with the sorcerer when he used his magic. Yeah, these villains seem to have easy access to <laughs> just <laughs> pop on screen, pop right into the room. <laughs> all are welcome. Well, yeah, that's one thing. You would think with all the things that Frank is devising, he doesn't come up with a way to protect Electra Base by like some sort of shield. Because yeah. sure <laughs> enough, there's the Empress of Evil appearing before him. She orders Frank to call the two back to Electra Base and then disappears as he complies. Because, of course, he's nervous anyway about this woman and wants them to come back. Yeah, he, he starts acting very nervous, very odd. He, the, the, he kind of the, the way he uh, the way he acted in the scene it was uh, he was really kind of playing with it. He seemed kind of silly and 
even even more nervous and awkward than usual. Yeah, yeah. I know that I, I didn't realize it, and we even see it in the opening credits. There's a lot of like hand wringing for Frank. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's fidgeting and <laughs> constantly. I mean, he lives in a basement full of a computer equipment, so he, it's it's an odd life for yeah. Frank. We're we're still on episode three here, and Frank hasn't gotten out of the basement yet. <laughs> Fra- Frank is the reason why there are so many people living in their parents' basement now, swearing that there is a career in this. He was the template to be a huge nerd and just stay in a basement com- full of computer equipment. Yes. <laughs> I'm telling you, Mom, this is going to pay off. <laughs> While obsessing over uh, beautiful women in superhero costumes. This exactly. is all adding up to every geek I've ever met. <laughs> That's the question we should ask them, those that live in the basement. Did you watch Electra Woman and Dida Girl? <laughs> I think I know the answer. I, I say this as I podcast from my basement. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're, <laughs> we're not excluding ourselves from this little club. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> now, I, I got to say, I loved in this particular episode, and again, which sort of gives me this impression this might be the first one, because there's a lot of angles of Electra Base that we've never seen before. They, they they jump around almost to give us like this idea of look at how big Electra Base is and look at what it's capable of and all this. We saw some of them in the earlier episodes, but we saw new ones and there were a lot of them there. And I'm like looking going, I'm wondering if this is basically almost like the pilot. Because also later on when Electra Woman is out with the Electra car, again, there's angles of the car we've never seen before, including a really good shot of the back as it takes off from an observatory that she goes to that I thought was really cool. Yeah, I, n- I noticed that too in, in the, the opening shots with Frank uh, in the base that, that there's one shot that's like just overhead. There's the, like they mounted mm-hmm. a camera on the ceiling fan over, <laughs> over Electra Base. Like it's a very strange just looking straight down on him as he's walking across the room. So interesting uh, directorial choices for this one. Right, exactly. Yeah. We find that the two are covering a flower show when they <laughs> get the call from Frank. <laughs> Boy, what kind of an assignment is that covering a flower show? Judy, a good reporter can make an interesting angle on any story. You mean like interviewing a man eating petunia? <laughs> yes, Frank. What is it? I don't know. You don't know? You, you'd better hurry back. I'll, uh, I'll tell you when you get here. We're on our way, Frank. <laughs> I love when we see them just coming out of one of their jobs as reporters like this. And it's always kind of those silly little moments. And it's just a few seconds before the before they get the call. But, yeah, we get Judy gets in her line about uh, how how could a flower show be interesting unless we're interviewing a man eating petunia. (laughs) I found myself just through this whole episode. I'm delighted by essentially any time Dinah Girl or Judy says anything. It's always just a gem. They gave her the best lines through this whole episode. (laughs) Well, I you know, I still maintain watching this. She's got that exuberance the way Burt Ward does and Burt Ward too got some of the best lines in in episodes of Batman yeah because Batman was the straight man obviously and right. Electra Woman is the straight woman of this of this duo so yeah that the sidekick gets the best stuff to say right exactly they head back to Electra Base show up you know coming out of the elevator in costume and uh, you know Frank is there showing how concerned he is and all for this but What gets interesting is we then cut to the Empress and her sidekick, and I'm going to use air quotes for this, uh, Lucretia. The world, my beloved Empress, you will take over the entire world. Yes, my dear Lucretia. How brilliant you are. There is nothing you cannot do, and no one can stop us. Not even Electra Woman and Dyna Girl. Not even Electra Woman and Dyna Girl. We will dispose of them with ease. They will not even be a challenge. I want to hear you talk like that. It is music to my ears. Show me your amazing powers, my beloved Empress. 
that sort of throws you off when she calls her, what did she call her? My beauty, my... Oh, she gushes on and on with yeah. <laughs> all kinds of things like that. And yeah, obviously, as the story unfolds, especially by the end, we're, we're going to see this in a whole new light. But it, it's one of those things where when you get to the twist at the end, now you want to go back and watch it with that knowledge now, because especially you're looking at Lucretia, look at her reactions, look at how she's speaking with the Empress of Evil, because what's really going on here? Right. Yeah. Now, did you get a chance to look up these two ladies? Yeah, absolutely. I, I always like to <laughs> to dive into who were these people that made these bizarre shows so long ago. So the Empress of Evil was Claudette Nevins. And I love that name. That sounds like such an old Hollywood kind of sounding yeah. glamorous name for an actress. But Claudette Nevins, who is still alive, I believe. She's 82. And I uh, was very busy as an actor in the especially the 70s, uh, 80s, 90s. Uh, just tons of one of those people that to name a drama series from the the 90s or in the 80s, and and she did some guest work on it, as well as uh, sitcoms, a little bit of everything. Very extensive credits, so she seemed to have a, a nice long career. Uh, she's I, I assume she's retired now. Her last credit was about 15 years ago. Oh yeah, I believe. And some so some interesting things uh, that caught my eye. Because, uh, again, it's mostly guest shots, uh, not a lot of regular series work, but a few here and there. She had some recurring parts in the 90s on things like Melrose Place and Jag. Uh, those shows she did multiple appearances on as the same character. One that was interesting to me, a show I, I do not remember. I've never seen, but there was a, just a, a show that ran maybe a half season in 1970 called Headmaster. Do you remember that one, John? No. Friday puts us together with Andy Griffith, our new headmaster. This is our school. It's a co-educational prep school, and I'm the headmaster. That's like a principal. Since all of our students are teenagers, we're going to try and deal with many of the situations that young people come up against these days. And in all of these stories, there'll be a combination of comedy and drama. We have a football team. They practice and they play, and they enjoy it. Our team's never won a game. Our coach is Jerry Van Dyke. Our caretaker and confidant is Parker Finley. This is where I live with my wife. She also teaches at the school. So you see, we won't always be involved with school problems because we have our family life to tell about. We're on every Friday night on CBS. Yeah, I'd kind of like to see that. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. Now I'm thinking that too. Well, I I still would like to see more episodes of the new Andy Griffith show that he did with Lee Merriweather. Oh wow! Yeah, where he played like I think it was a mayor of a town, and it was kind of like. Mayberry, basically, but a little bit more modern. And it was like, mm -hmm. what was the po you gave up Mayberry and then you come back and do this show? Um, yep. you know, but but yeah, I, I was thinking I'd like to see more of those. But it's funny to think, with the exception of Matlock, he's pretty much after uh Andy Griffith's show just had this string of you know half season shows. I mean, Salvage One and all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's fun when you look back at these because the major actors like that with those iconic shows, you remember their one or two monster long-running hit shows. But all those guys also have some misfires here and there and some some little forgotten shows yeah. that uh, are, are uh, hard to even come by <laughs> these days. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if, if uh, I'd like to track down an episode of Headmaster, <laughs> <laughs> Claudette Nevins, if I could. A uh, little bit of voice work for cartoons and things, including a, a, a big credit that popped out for me was the Planet of the Apes cartoon series from the mid-70s. Claudette was one of the regular actors on that. She, she voiced uh, essentially the two female leads on that show because she was Judy, who was one of the human astronaut characters in the cartoon, and also Nova. Ah. And that's a series that I just rewatched the whole series just earlier this year because we did a panel at DragonCon this year about the Planet of the Apes cartoon. Oh, okay. And it was a fun panel, and that's a cool show. And it was like, oh, it was. It was, uh, DePatey Frailing uh, produced it, and very limited, very limited animation. You're just, you're looking at drawings 
<laughs> for for a lot of it, but really well written, really smart. They took it very seriously, and and a, a, like a one long ongoing unfolding story. So a really cool show. So I recommend checking that out. And you can hear some some good voice work from Claudette Nevins. And I think the only credit of Claudette's that I made a particular note of is uh, she was on a two part episode of One Day at a Time, and this was the wedding episodes when Valerie Bertinelli. Uh, as Barbara when she got married in the, I think this was an early 80s episode, but Claudette played the mother of uh, Valerie Bertinelli's new husband oh. on that show. And uh, that's interesting, uh, be, well, for a couple of reasons, because also that, that would have meant that she would have been, uh, at one point that character was married to Howard Hessman, because Howard Hessman played the father of uh Barbara's new husband and, and eventually became a regular on it got one day at a time got a little crazy to, <laughs> to yeah, the end last, last couple of seasons they brought in Howard Hesman and he married Bonnie Franklin so now it's like the it was a mother and daughter who were uh, uh, yeah mother and daughter married to yep. a father and son <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually going through the series now I'm on season four so oh wow yeah so the, the, there's some crazy stuff coming towards the end <laughs> yeah. like that and it's also fun because that's a Croft connection that's a Croft super show connection of course because Michael Lembeck was a regular on one day at a time as Julie's husband yep and of course that's Captain Cool from Captain Cool and the Kongs here on the Croft <laughs> super show just like Electro Woman yeah I, I it, it's so weird to think of him as you know Captain Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. He was so fun, just that goofy kind of New York Brooklyn accent, and Captain Cool and the Kongs. I loved yeah. uh, who host, hosted the Croft Super Show with all these anthology series like Electro Woman. And he's a busy guy these days as well. He's been very successful as a director. I think in more recent years, I think he's mm. lo- mainly known as a director. Right. Right. Uh, Jack Jacqueline Hyde was Lucretia. See, she she the, uh, looks more familiar to me. Yeah, and 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 yet she had a, not as many credits listed. Again, if you, if you pull her up on IMDb, uh, not as extensive as far as how many shows she did. But obviously, as we see in the show, she she could play it up and and be a very strong presence on the screen. So you probably do notice her in the things that she was in. Uh, Jacqueline uh, died in 1992 at the age of 60, uh, oh. but had a bunch of credits uh, through the 1960s and 70s, especially. Uh, not a lot was really popping out at me at things that that I would have necessarily remembered her from. Uh, but uh, yeah, some some fun stuff in there. Did a lot of a lot of TV, a lot of movies. Well, she, as I say, she stood out to me because there she is fawning over the empress <laughs> you think okay you know you know who's in charge you know who the, the 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 bad guy is and you and and even like where she says demonstrate your power for me so she takes this chest elevates it then spins it around and with a nice little touch has it explode as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's rather bizarre the whole <laughs> exploding chest sequence yes <laughs> and she's just delighted make it go faster and make it spin look what, what are we doing yes <laughs> what a bizarre demonstration of your powers <laughs> well you know what was even more bizarre i thought was after the demonstration and they're sort of like getting all worked up that they're going to get electro woman and such i thought the empress was a little too grabby with herself <laughs> if you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah you know you're right <laughs> That was an, it, <laughs> that was it, an interesting uh, choice, yeah. Play, as opposed to really play it up rather, uh, perhaps borderline inappropriate for a kids show. For a kids show, it reminded me of this uh, BBC production of Macbeth, where Lady Macbeth went over the top with her unsex me scene, and she's <laughs> just writhing on a bed, grabbing herself, and it's like, wow. um, no, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, hey, well, if they ever need another Lady Macbeth, there you go. We can we can bring her in. <laughs> get Claudette Nevins, get her back. <laughs> you know, one more thing. It just occurred to me as I said the name Jacqueline Hyde, the the actress who played Lucretia. Is that like a Hollywood name she made up with, going for a Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde kind of a pun sounding? You know, her name Jacqueline is Jack- Hyde. Jacqueline Hyde. Wow. Like, I, didn't, I did not catch that until I was saying it out loud just a minute ago. But what's that about? 
<laughs> maybe it was one of those uh, things where she promoted herself as someone who could play any role. Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I can do anything. I'm Jekyll and Hyde. I'm Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> yeah, because again, I'm assuming that's a stage name that, you know, because that, that was probably more typical than not back then is you would come up with your, your name as an actor. But right. interesting name for an actress to go with. Of course, now you realize that could be also the name of a villain in the future who it's like we didn't realize it's Jacqueline Hyde and she turned into the monster. Yes, that also sounds like the kind of clever name that <laughs> somebody would come up with for a, a silly horror show or something. Right. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. Now, back at Electra Base, Frank is demonstrating the Electro Split, which we now <laughs> see creates two of any item it sort of splits them well that's what he calls it split but it's really supposed to be a duplicator i don't know if it's uh, a splitter but i guess the principle is that it splits something away because the duplicate is unstable as he shows with these two bottles of what i think are chocolate milk strange looking bottles the, yeah the bright shiny red <laughs> but what kind of looked like a milk bottle right exactly and and he picks one up and it's it's brittle in his hands it just collapses in his hands also he points out the other flaw and i'm thinking this isn't a flaw this is not something you want to do it cannot duplicate humans <laughs> yeah that was bizarre the way he unspooled that information <laughs> yeah this will crumble in your hand and also i'm so sorry we can't do this with people <laughs> Um, but he says he's hoping that it can be used in some way as a distraction device. I guess if there's two of you, one one can go off and be the uh, draw the fire. <laughs> it was very strange. Uh, and also, it was weird the way he said, I suppose maybe this is a safety feature that it doesn't work on people. <laughs> well, yeah, I would say it is. But also, didn't you invent this? Don't you know if it's a safety feature or not? <laughs> I know that reminds me of, uh, was it Six Million Dollar Man? Or no, it was Batman, where they were like, he's invented uh, how to make ice or something like that. It was like something crazy. And the professor's like, I don't know how I did it. I just did. And I'm like, you're the guy who, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of those kinds of things, you know. Yeah. I yeah. guess I guess the safety device is the laws of nature saying you shouldn't do this. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a very weird scene. Mm. But we ate it up as kids. Sure, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Now the Empress communicates with Electra Woman and Dinah Girl. I will tell you what I intend to do. Simply to rule the entire world. I shall be empress of the world. Yeah, well, we've got a better place for you to rule. It's about six feet by six feet with iron bars. I do not take your crime scope operation lightly. You, Electro Woman and Dinah Girl, are the only ones who could delay my ascent to power. And so, as a true believer in divide and conquer, I shall make my first move. Dino girl! <laughs> Frank, get me a fix on the hideout of the Empress. Right. Come on, Crime Scope. If we find the hideout, I think we'll find Dino girl. One thing that kind of amused me about this is until she suddenly zaps Dinah Girl away, all she's done is pop up on their screen and laugh maniacally. And Dinah Girl is immediately <laughs> locked in saying, like, you're going to go to jail. You're, you're <laughs> been, like, she hasn't done anything. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's like, OK, you're the villain of the week. So I guess you're evil and we have to stop you. But all she'd really done is kind of tell them that she had a big announcement to make. That's true. But yeah, now an actual actual crime starts happening now, at least with the kidnapping of Dinah Girl. Exactly. Yeah. Now now we actually have that. You're right. <laughs> we cut to the Empress of Evil's hideout where Dinah Girl tries to escape by using her electric comp and discovers it's missing that the Empress has it in her hand. It's funny because you're right. I'm just thinking about this now. The first two episodes, at least, there were schemes, there were plans and Electra Woman and Dinah Girl sort of stepped in to thwart it. In this one, the plan is basically, let's just get rid of Electra Woman and Dinah Girl. 
yeah, they just pop up say, we're, we're going to, hello, we're going to take over the world. She's going to be the empress of the world. I think yeah. they announced at one point. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. It, it's just, yeah, there's not really another crime off to the side. They're not trying to rob or take all the gold like in, in the previous one. It's just, we're the villain. You're the hero. Let's do this. Yeah. It, it kind of reminded me of playing around as kids. Sure. You know, we, we, we got you, we got your your teammate now come and get them and off we go to their place and hide out and whatever, you know, in the neighborhood and get them. And there's all these rules and all of a sudden my powers don't work because I said so. This is just evil for evil's sake. It's the Empress of Evil. <laughs> Did you notice also there's a lot of laughter between Lucretia and the Empress? Oh yeah, they are having a great time together. And again, there's there's a twist on this entire relationship. Yes, yep, there is. Now the electric car takes Electro Woman to an observatory, which I thought was right. really cool. I'm like, oh, cool, there's an observatory. And then we get inside, and it looks more like a medieval castle. <laughs> yeah, that, that that was an interesting choice for the exterior shot. Yeah. But that's all right. I guess someone, they just like the looks of that building. Right. <laughs> now, this was cool. Electra Woman comes in. She sees Dinah Girl at the end of this corridor, suspended above. She's just floating <laughs> there. So she uses her electric comp to negate the gravity and goes up to get her. But that then creates the trap because suddenly a cage appears around them <laughs> with a cauldron below yeah. filled with this like vat of creatures. <laughs> yeah. It, it looked like, okay, those are just snakes at first, but no, there's some kind of crazy freaky Muppet show, little shop of horrors, writhing, wriggling monster thing happening. Yeah. <laughs> at first I thought it was just acid. I'm thinking, all right, you know, they overdid it with the, the plumes. I, cause I said, they look snake like, and yep. then when they cut to the, overhead and you see the like you said the, like little shop of horrors monster freaks you know muppet freaks it was like wow okay i i actually kind of wish they lingered a little more on it because it's like sure. you went to all that effort and you didn't linger on it very long it might have been that man-eating petunia that judy was hoping that they could cover for the magazine <laughs> yeah, be careful what you wish for judy yeah exactly the cage begins to lower towards the vat so electro woman tells dinah girl to jump up and grab the top of the cage and then with you know dinah girl's free hand she's <sighs> supposed to i thought this was cool i'm like going she's not doing it herself she says dinah girl activate the electric yeah. force beam or whatever and yep. and so dinah girl does it because remember dinah girl doesn't have her comp she has to do it on electro woman's which was again at least some nice continuity compared yes. to when we had a lost electric comp before in one of the episodes i think sometimes they forget wait a minute, who has the electric comp and who doesn't <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and the, the the bars of their little cage just drop away yes <laughs> very quietly it was very kind quietly of a, a subtle, not a spectacular escape moment it's just kind of all right, now the bars just slowly flop out off to the side. Yeah, I thought that was weird, actually, that they, they sort of, like, like someone must have been asleep on the sound effects. Yeah, there's no sound effect. It, it, it was weird because it was so quiet. Yeah, yeah. Um, it allows them, though, to jump away from the cage as it sinks into the cauldron. And I liked how uh, Dinah Girl... Uh, yells that it, that was electric close and then we get we get frank who's just listening in walking going what was what was what's going I love that, on i know I love that he's just getting the audio and <laughs> is whining that he does not he, he's missing out on exactly what's happening and they don't even tell him they're like we'll tell you later There's no <laughs> yeah well we've only got eight minutes we gotta go <laughs> So they got to get the electric comp back. So they rush back to, you know, the area where the Empress. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm blank there for a second. I don't know. Yeah, they, they track down the Empress of Evil. Although at this point, Dinah Girl refers to her as the Empress Bull Weevil. Yes, which I thought was an interesting turn of phrase for her. <laughs> <laughs> we would have gotten it back then. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I remember learning about the Bull Weevil in mm -hmm. school. <laughs> yes. There was, there was even a song called the Bull Weevil. Was there a song? I yep. don't know the song. Little old bug, he sure is evil. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who could resist that rhyme when you're writing a song? What I liked was that, you know, Electra Woman 
pulls the comp away from her by using her own electric comp. And I also noticed this time around in, in this, the Empress's throne. I like the two skulls on the armrests. <laughs> Absolutely. That was a cool <laughs> throne with the skulls on it. Yeah. And the skull theme is going to even play a little later on in the story yes. even better. Yes. yes. Uh, which, again, it's a Saturday morning show. And there's certain things like the cauldron or like this throne or like what we're going to see later where you're like, that was really cool. And all for a few moments of the show. It's not like it's anything long term. It's not like it's anything planned that, you know, we didn't see the Empress again after this. This is her only appearance. You can appreciate when you look back at these, just the the care and the effort that goes into all these sets and all these costumes for these little bits that are going to be on TV for a minute. Yeah. And never used again. Yeah. The two try to subdue the Empress with their electro force field, but she's able to walk right through it. And that's when we find out that the Empress has this anti-power that isn't affected by the electric comps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's also a fun moment because we have Frank trying to inform them, your electric comps are useless, <laughs> with which they, they respond in unison because they kind of figured it out at that point. Thanks for the information, Frank. <laughs> Get a nice sarcastic response to Frank. Yeah, Frank is kind of useless in this episode, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he's, throughout the whole thing, they're kind of figuring things out at the same time that he is. Right. It's almost like, what's your point, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> but, but in the end, his electric split will prove useful. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, so the Empress casts, and I'm guessing this is a spell that she casts. I, I, you know, we never really get into that, her power. What is it based on? Um, later on, we'll figure it out all, what, what the whole thing is based on. But I'm going to say a spell for the sake of it here. And that's when we sure. get the, the funky 70s effects. Because <laughs> basically, she's going to rip Electra Woman and Dyna Girl apart by stretching them out like, like a pair of Stretch Armstrongs. <laughs> yes, and man, it just goes on and on. You get a lot of uh, stretched Electra Woman and Dyna Girl visuals. Yeah, and Frank is trying to save them by trying to figure out what's going on, but then he's got his own problems because the Empress and Lucretia attack Electra Base. Oh, hurry, crime scope. We've got to figure out how they're being... <laughs> Don't trouble yourself. It's too late for them and for you. <laughs> Can there be any hope for our crime fighting trio? Is it indeed too late? The exciting conclusion of Electro Woman and Dinah Girl is next. Stay tuned. Hiya, Larry. What you got there? I'm selling corn. Larry's, Larry's, Larry's corn. I got my name on there three times. Oh, I see. Three times means you can't buy better. Is that so? Yeah, this corn tastes like it just came off the cob. We sweet and tender, crisp and golden. And it's better than Libby's, 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 right? Yep. <laughs> Libby's, Libby's, Libby's. Three of the best names in the business. Well, that's quite an improvement, let me tell you. We asked some folks to try new moisture-tasting breakfast squares. Yeah, that breakfast squares were dry. I like this better. It's really good. When I say it's good, it's good. Breakfast squares. It's always been a great idea. A complete light meal and two frosted bars. Now, they're moisture-tasting. Great tasting. They're good. They're really terrific. New moisture-tasting breakfast squares. Smart eating in this busy world. It's good. Gigi stars Leslie Caron, Louis Jordan, and Marie Chevalier, Saturday night at 11.30 here on Channel 7. Weekday mornings at 9, your phone is a direct line to the experts on AM Los Angeles. Experts like baby doctor Lyndon Smith, handyman Al Carroll, interior designer Phyllis Morris, astrologer Joyce Gilson, makeup artist Daniel Eastman, and psychologist Dr. Irene Casorla. Your phone is a direct line to Regis, Sarah, Bob, and the experts. Weekday mornings at 9 on Channel 7. Did you see who stole that potato? Yeah. Are you going to be a witness? I'll okay. See? Fred ain't no stool pigeon. He's a witness. There's a difference. 
It don't take a lot of courage to lay back and keep your mouth shut. What takes class is to stand up and be counted. If you see a crime, don't be a pigeon. Be a witness. Ain't that right? This week, TV Guide explains a fall phenomenon, World Series jitters. Read how pressure affects performance in TV Guide. If I remember correctly, I know we see it in part two, but if I remember correctly, at the end of part one, some of the computers start exploding, too. Yeah, that's what, Frank has that the, a button on the floor. Yes. <laughs> it's a giant button on the floor. With, I don't know I don't know how he doesn't accidentally hit that button all the time because all he does <laughs> is pace around that room. Right. Uh, but yeah, he hits the button and then all the computers just start going crazy. Yep, yep. And an alarm bell goes off and you're wondering, what is he sounding the alarm for? <laughs> um, and it has no effect on him because, you know, I mean, it, it, has, it seems to have no effect on them because... Uh, the Empress elevates Frank and, and sends him up, you know, not too high, though, considering, like we said, we established that shot. They, she didn't send him very high. Yeah, but it's a, and a very funny visual because when Dinah Girl and Elect- Electra Woman, they were levitating earlier in the episode, but still standing upright. But she yeah. levitates Frank and <laughs> turns him over 90 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so he looks just completely silly hovering up there. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Now, it turns out what that alarm was, and I don't get this entirely, but somehow it managed to short-circuit what the Empress was doing to Electra Woman and Dina Girl because they weren't stretching anymore, and they actually try to call him back to thank him, but he can't answer. (laughs) Yep, yep. And we get another fantastic Dina Girl sarcastic line. Just remind me never to do any stretching exercises again. <laughs> yep. Per- perfectly Robin. All that is like... <laughs> That's right. You know, it's perfectly Robin. And we also get, as I mentioned, those great angles of the electric car getting better visuals of them. You know, if you ever wanted to design your own electric car, this is a good episode to watch because you can see... Uh, the exteriors. The interiors, you'd need to watch some other episodes, but the exteriors, this one gives you some nice angles as the car departs yes. the observatory because they're heading back to Electra Base. I don't think we have to say if you want to design your own electric car. <laughs> <laughs> of course we do. <laughs> of course we do. How come, come that on. car never gets so much love when, when they talk about the great cars of the 70s and they're like, you know, oh, here's you know Starsky and Hutch or here's right. Kent if you want to go to the 80s and stuff or here's the Batmobile. Nobody says, hey, here's the electric car. Electric car and Wonderbug also on the Croft Super Show. There you go. A couple of fantastic Croft vehicles. Yep. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> now, at Electra Base, the Empress has now programmed the computer to self-destruct. Electra Woman and Dinah Girl arrive. Their power still has no effect on the Empress and Lucretia. But for some odd reason, considering it has no effect, the two run off anyway. (laughs) See, this is what I mean about the whole, like, it's like a a child's game the way this plays out. Because to me, it's like, as the writer, I'm thinking, okay, you've set this up. Unless there's some other, you know, deus ex machina that's coming in here and saving the day like a power failure that stops the self-destruct, they've won. This is it, you know? Yeah. yeah you've yeah. got the neg power. You've got everything else going. What's the problem? But they run. Yeah, you're right. I, I like that that way of looking at it. There's, it just makes it seem like a game. This is heroes versus villains, and it's okay. It, we're the villains, and it's our turn to make a quick escape. Right. For no good reason. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Electra Woman then manages to stop the self-destruct. Dinah Girl brings Frank down. The Electra de-gravitator. Yes. <laughs> Are you all right, Frank? Yes, I, I think so, Dinah Girl, but that was an awfully close one. <laughs> so, you have managed to save yourselves and your ridiculous Electra base. Well, it will do you no good. Yep. And and see now here's the thing. It's like, okay, you're mad. I like I, I would feel like I, I, I'd be talking to one of my students here right now at this point, because the Empress flies into a rage because her plan failed. And I'm like thinking, your plan failed because you allowed it. You ran away, you know? <laughs> yep. So what she does is she 
brings the two back. She grabs them both through her, and I'm going to keep saying this, magic, and teleports them back to the observatory. And the Dinah Girl line we get here is, again, it's another just sarcastic aside from Dinah Girl, but topical for the era, which is unusual, because Dinah Girl says... This is a great way to fight the energy crisis, but I'm getting a little tired of being yanked from one place to another. We must be back in the hideout, Dinah Girl. Come on, let's see if we can find them. So, wow, to actually, you know, plant a, a, a news item, a, a, an issue of the day of the mid 70s into this kid's show was interesting. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I can remember back then being just as concerned and, and remembering being online on the odd number days for my family because That's that was right. our, our license plate to get gas. The gas lines. Yep. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Are you, you kids listening? <laughs> yeah, you could only buy gas on certain days depending on your license plate because yeah. they, they had they, the demand was not keeping up with the supply during right. this energy crisis. Yep. God, I'd be terrible at that today because I let this tank run down to the very end before I go in to refill. So I'd be like, oh, I got to wait a whole day. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. So as they say, she brings them back. But it's like someplace in the observatory. So Electra Woman starts tracking the Empress down with her electric comp. There's this weird sound. And then we see this creature. Electra, wow, what is that? I repeat, what is that? In the distance, it's like all covered in rags moving <laughs> towards them. I loved this bit. Um, oh, yeah. I loved it, but I was also a little disappointed that it wasn't more of a threat. Yeah, it, I, I love that here's this whole new bizarre element being yeah. introduced this deep into the story. Suddenly a whole other character. Yeah, and 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 yet nothing. I mean, there's, of sorts. There's <laughs> of sorts. Very, I mean, it yeah, serves I mean, a purpose, but... and it, Yeah, and such a cool visual. You know, it's this bizarre looking creature with the rags and, and dancing almost, kind of doing a hula dance a little bit at yep. first. <laughs> yep. a, a very strange looking and yeah, just kind of leads them in a direction and is identified as a banshee. As a banshee. Uh, and even Judy says, if you hear the banshee, you've run out of time. And I'm like thinking, okay, how are they going to deal with this? Oh, no. Right, right. It just wants us to follow it. <laughs> And it, it's yet again, throughout this episode, it's Frank figures out, he's looking at his printout back at the base and realizes that this is a banshee at the same time that Electra woman is just kind of looking at it. And I think I know what that is. <laughs> 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 She's run into lots of banshees over the years, evidently. Like, oh, yeah. I recognize this thing. Yeah. Uh, so we have a, a new player emerged here. Uh, the banshee was played by Jean Sarah Frost, Ooh. who... Did not have a very extensive acting career at all. Has a handful of credits from like the mid seventies through the early eighties, but some interesting ones. Like she she did a Fantasy Island as a named character. I think sort of a primitive like cave woman type character or something like that yeah. uh, on a, on a, a sequence on a Fantasy Island episode. She did an episode of Arc Two, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, that was one of those live action filmation science fiction series of the same era and she did one of those uh also had a small part in annie hall at this time wow and which coincidentally uh, jacqueline hyde also had a woody allen credit jacqueline hyde uh, has a, is has a small part in take the money and run wow but uh sarah jean frost uh, i think her had a later career though i think the acting kind of dried up because by the mid 80s she was working as a casting director and actually has a lot of casting director credits as well did a lot of casting for uh, scarecrow and mrs king <laughs> and misfits of science ah the misfits <laughs> those classic misfits <laughs> mid 80s uh science fiction show with courtney cox yes yes <laughs> very fun now someday there will so, be a uh, misfits of science podcast gotta do it <laughs> <laughs> so that's our banshee sarah uh, jean sarah frost with with no dialogue just beckoning and, and leading them, you know, to back to the chamber where, like I said, I love this. It's this large skull and they're looking at it and suddenly the mouth opens and we <laughs> see now that that's where the throne was. 
This was like a prop from a Spinal Tap concert, or something. <laughs> like a cheap heavy metal band. Let's have a giant skull rise up and then we emerge. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the arena of the skull. <laughs> arena. Come on, Crime Scope. We've got to figure out why the electrocops don't work against the Empress of Evil before it's too late. Come closer, Electro Woman Dyna Girl. Come, come. Might as well, ladies. Come closer and listen to what my beautiful Empress has to say to you. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, my beloved Empress. Tell them. I have brought you here to tell you how much I admire your courage. And your ingenuity. <laughs> and therefore... To submit to you a challenge, a challenge, we will fight the ultimate duel, your powers against mine. Electra, terrific. Our powers don't work against yours. Oh, so they don't. Their powers don't work against mine. What a shame. Yes, what a shame. <laughs> that does make it seem unfair. <laughs> We accept your challenge. I'm just looking at the, the, There's so much that is so great here. And it's just things said. And then it's like, it has no other meaning after that. Yeah. It, just, I mean, just... imagine if you would. Imagine if you would, because you think about this for a moment. Imagine if you would. There's Tina Turner going, welcome to Thunderdome. <laughs> and then that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing ever is said again. Nothing is ever. And, and the rest of the movie goes on and you're like. That sounds cool, Thunderdome. Tell me more. <laughs> it just they're just throwing things in. Here's a banshee. Here's here's the arena of the skull. Yeah. There's even the Empress of Evil's costume we haven't really mentioned, but yeah. the kind of giant bat thing on her head, I think. Yes. It's just kind of generic evil, whatever, throw it all in there. Yep. <laughs> I wonder I cuz you know, at least with the last two with Glitter Rock and uh um what's his name? Is it the sorcerer? Uh, the sorcerer. You know, their costumes kind of made sense. You know, it, it fit their personalities and stuff. You wonder where they were going with this. Like, what was the costume designer thinking? You know, like, what represents evil? <laughs> I guess that that was the, the puzzle they had to solve. Was yeah. It's, it's Empress. It's not, the, it's not a bat lady. It's not a, a skull lady. But yeah. it's just, okay, what's generic evil stuff, I guess? Bats and skulls. So throw them in there. Well, that's the other thing, too, I guess. The costume designer and the set designer didn't work together on this because <laughs> you would have thought there'd be some skulls somewhere in her costume. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, meanwhile, Frank is back at the base, still trying to figure out why the electrocomps have no effect on the Empress. And what I thought was interesting is, like you said, I forget, does Frank actually find out or is it only Electro Woman that figures this one out? They both figure it out simultaneously. They, I mean, again. It, was, it was another instance of Frank's about to explain it to them. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we got it, Frank. We got it, we got it, Frank. Thanks for everything. <laughs> I like how Frank says it, though. Uh, he says, we've got to find out what makes the Empress of Evil so invulnerable. Yeah. And that line amused me because, and the, it, this is not my line, but somebody at some point I, I read somewhere said that when, when you were kids – you knew who the comic book readers were in your class because they were the kids who knew what the word invulnerable means. <laughs> that's funny. That's that's cute. I like yeah, that. Yeah, because that was me. <laughs> <laughs> I read enough Superman comics. I knew invulnerable. <laughs> now, I did like this bit. The Empress admits she admires the two. So she challenges them to a competition that Electro Woman accepts, even though she knows the comps are useless. It's once again, here we go. You're, <laughs> it's heroes and villains, and so we must do battle. Right, exactly. It, well, yeah, exactly. Again, it's it's the kids at play. So, of course, the battle begins. The flames, the roaring, wonderful flames, my beloved Empress. The Empress casts this spell, surrounding the two of them in this pit of flame. Dinah girl. Electro, wow! <laughs> now, Dinah girl, Electro degravitate. Electro degravitate, the most beautiful word in the world. They're on this little piece of, of floor <laughs> and the flames, and of course, it's it's some really dodgy effects, but it still works. <laughs> that, it, it works maybe just barely. <laughs> barely, yeah. <laughs> that was, even by Croft standards, that, that was a... 
that was a pretty low budget pit of flames. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then this is where it gets weird. Because, we because Lucretia seems to have lost faith. have not worked against the Empress. Wasn't that a shocking moment? Can I you imagine like, for kids watching this, what a turn right. for this adoring sidekick. She yeah. was just gushing in love with her leader, her boss, the Empress of Evil, and then suddenly Lucretia says to Empress of Evil, you worthless misfit. Yeah. Wow. What's happening? What's hap- what, what suddenly <laughs> did that? You know? Speaking of what's happening, John, we still have to do a, a series episode breakdown of every episode of what's happening. Happening, yes. <laughs> what's happening <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Coming in 2026. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Great crime scope, you confirmed exactly what I was just thinking. Electro Woman! Electro Woman! Dyna Girl! The Crusher! Use the Crusher! Yes, Lucretia. I will do just as you say. Get the Empress with the Electro The Electra Split! But the Electra Split doesn't work on human beings! You're absolutely right, Dyna Girl! But. What's happening? <laughs> Electra trouble. Now we have to fight too. This was maybe the most terrifying thing <laughs> I remember ever seeing from children's TV of the 70s. But that one shot, the close up of it, and it's we're not looking at Claudette's actual face anymore. It's some kind of like a weird death mask version. Yes. That we see in double. That thing was terrifying. <laughs> what a monstrous, scary, horrifying image that was. Those the the creepy death mask version of the Empress. Wow. Yep. yep. And because of the using the Electra split, the Empress is unstable. So <laughs> she yeah, falls we get that apart. Little pile of smoking rubble where yes. once the Empress stood. That was once the Empress. That was once. An android. Here comes the big reveal of the yeah. whole thing. And man, the, the, the information is fast and flying at the end. Hang oh, on. because oh, it's so fast and, and, you know. So then all those traps of the Empress of Evil were merely illusions. Right, Judy. Created by the great Lucretia, once the world's most famous hypnotist. Yes, and quite an electronics genius in her own right, building a fantastic android like the Empress. What a story. Listen, we better get over to newsmakers and file it right away. Yeah. Just a magazine story? You've got enough here for a whole book. Hey, that's not a bad idea. I've got it. We'll dedicate it to you. You don't have to. Oh, you're joking. No. <laughs> oh, Frank. We love the joke of you. <laughs> That's the thing I think that's just so sad about this show is that, you know, had this even been Scooby Doo, there would have been a clue at some point that we could have all latched onto and said, "Oh, I get it." Or even if we didn't see the clue, or we saw it but we didn't get it, at least in the end, then when the explanation comes, you go, "Oh, that makes sense." There's yep. nothing in here to suggest this at all, except the very ending. The exposition we get that she was once the world's most famous hypnotist. A hypnotist. That's it. <laughs> and. She's an electronic genius. Yes. <laughs> so I guess everything that was happening, the teleporting, you know, because she was literally zapping away Electra Woman and Dyna Girl, transporting mm -hmm. them across space electronically. This was, right. I, I guess she's on a par or beyond what, what Frank is able to come up with, all the tricks that the electrocomps can do. Right. Lucretia, even more so, can just make amazing magical things happen electronically. Well, here's here's the thing, okay? I would say she used her hypnotism in a way, like say for instance, the first time she attacks the base, they get in there, they're able with their hypnotism to get 
up to Frank and such. Then there's Electra Woman and Dinah Girl. Mass hypnosis on the three of them. They grab Dinah Girl. When she comes out of it, she doesn't know how much time has passed. And we never oh. talk about how much time has passed. So it's not really she teleported. She just grabbed and they stayed in a stupor until, <laughs> you know, she was able to get away. Wow. That's interesting, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, um, what's his name from uh, the Marvel Comics Mastermind? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Wow. Yeah. That, that's, that's the only way I could figure this. Now, the other <laughs> question is, why? Because she never gets <laughs> into that. Why Electra Woman and Dinah Girl? There's nothing there. Like, once I get them out of the way, then I can use my mass hypnotism to take over the world or anything like that. Because, again... We're rushing for the ending, and we still got to get the cute bit at, at the end with Frank saying, "Oh, this is better than a magazine story. You should write a book about it." Yeah, that <laughs> that little uh, end tag scene. Now we're we're out of costume. It's it's Laurie and Judy yep. with Frank, and that was a bizarre little moment as well because Frank's saying, "Yeah, you could get a whole book out of this." Okay, that's great. Then we get Judy says, "And you know what, Frank? We'll dedicate the book to you." Yeah, And then Frank says, oh, wait a minute, you're joking. You would never really dedicate a book to me. And they all laugh. <laughs> yes, of course we're joking. You're correct, Frank. We would, you're the weird dude in our basement. We would never dedicate a book to you. <laughs> well, we wouldn't want to let the world know that we've got Frank in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, goofy tag scene aside... If you try to make make sense, it sounds weird to even say that. Make sense of the of the story or, or of the of the the schemes, the the idea, the plan of Lucretia. Lucretia has that. There's <laughs> there's something going on with Lucretia. This well, this is a yeah. Th this is obviously an insane. She's a hypnotist. She's an electronics genius. She's also quite in insane. I think. Yeah. Uh, and that's why she's built this android to fawn over. Because it wasn't like all. A trick that everything that happened was that was not just to fool our heroes because we there were scenes of Lucretia with the Empress of Evil all by themselves. Yep, and she's they're laughing and spinning the trunks around and 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 she's you know adoring her supposed leader. That's all just for Lucretia's own amusement. Yeah, yeah. When you just think bizarre. about it, it's like you're alone by. It's like you can drop the guys when you're alone. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Lucretia was clearly just out of her mind. <laughs> and, and even the last thing we see of Lucretia is just that long, horrifying scream after the collapse of the Empress. That that scene just closes on Lucretia screaming. Yeah. Just kind of dark, weird stuff to throw on the end of this kid show. No, it definitely I, is. It definitely I loved is. it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as we come to the end of this episode. How would you, in the same way that we did with Batcave, having Bert doing holy whatever, how would you, Electra, sum up this whole episode? Yeah, I, it was so fun through the whole thing and just the goofy villains popping back and forth. But to me, it, it all it all comes down to that turn, that shocking twist at the end where it gets so dark and so bizarre. And, and, and again, that shot of that death mask version, which is the scariest thing I've ever seen. I'm going to have to go with Electra horrifying. <laughs> I, I, I'm in the same vein. I'm just going to be like, though, more like Electra, huh? Because <laughs> oh, it, it was going so great. And then you get to the end. It almost makes you wish that this was like a full length two parter like Batman. You get your 25 minutes and let's do the whole thing and let's do it right. And yes, at some point. You know, maybe in the second part, we learn Lucretia is actually pulling all the strings, but they don't right away, you yeah. know, or whatever. But it just, wow, story wise, this was a great idea. And I'm even fine with the fact that, hey, Lucretia was also an electronics expert, whatever, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, but just after all that, after the back and forth and the, and like I said, it's kids at play more than anything, this story. That's all there is to it. There's no other real substance. You just had a lot of cool moments that, yeah, as kids, you can remember. Remember that time we snuck into their base and stole their whatever, you know, uh, for whatever reason. <laughs> you know. Let's try to get inside the heads of the writers for a minute. <laughs> Do you think 
that they had this idea as they wrote the whole script, they knew that twist ending was coming or was it they get towards the end and say, oh, you know what? Let's do this at the end. I can see that going either way. I'll take that even I'll take it even a step further. If what we suggested at the beginning is true and this was the pilot episode, what the hell were the networks thinking? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's to look at it that way is if this was meant to be the first one. Yeah, that's a weird one to start on. Right. Uh, But I almost feel like if. If the writer just decided at the end, just in the moment, okay, you know what? Let's make Lucretia the surprise villain at the end. That would kind of explain the rush to explain it. Like right. we're going to have to just tack a line on the end to say, oh yeah, she's a hypnotist. She's an, she's an electronics expert. Right. The end. I mean, I'm I'm even fine with the whole thing of using the electric split to stop the Empress because she was an. I mean, all of that is cool. It's just the rush, the ending. It's like. Wow. And you're sitting there going, what, what, what? (laughs) (laughs) And on the other hand, I think this kind of show works best if just pack it in. Electra Woman, every episode is just so fast paced. It's so many quick cuts. We're always jumping back and forth between scenes, between locations. And I think it really works best in that way. Because as much as we love these goofy old kid shows from decades ago, the ones that are slower paced just crawl and those are the ones that are a lot more of a chore to try to get through true that's true so if they had more time they might have just stretched things out and (laughs) it it would just be a more boring show right (laughs) well that's going to do it for this episode of the back cave podcast before we go kevin what's happening over at the flopcast Wow, we've been so busy over at the Flopcast, and uh, I don't know when this show is going to come out, but as we're heading into 2020, our first episode of the year 2020 will be Flopcast episode 400. Wow. So we're very excited about that, and that's it's a weekly show, so that means it's been 400 weeks of the <laughs> Flopcast <laughs> going back to 2012. So yeah, this, is, uh, this week that we're heading into is our big uh, 400th episode week that we're getting ready for. Um, again, depending on when people hear this, uh, I'm going to be appearing. We're both going to be appearing, actually. My co-host, Cornflake, and I will both be at Aresia, which is a big science fiction fantasy convention in Boston uh, in the middle of January 2020. We'll be there covering Aresia for the Flopcast, and I'm going to be doing some panels on some very fun subjects. So uh, come find me there if you're around Boston. Very cool. Very cool. And, of course, if you want to find episodes of the Flopcast, you can catch it on most of the great uh, podcast carriers like iTunes and Stitcher and all that. Or head on over to Flopcast.net, correct? Yes, our website is Flopcast.net, and our show is also part of the ESO Network. So if you go to ESO Network, you'll find us there as well. Very cool. Very cool. So next time Kevin and I get together, we get back to a story that actually has, at least from the description, a plot of a theft, of a a scheme, a crime, because Alibaba wants (laughs) the metamorphosis formula to turn everyone evil. So there's some substance here from the sounds of it. I'm, I'm looking forward to it also because Malachi Throne plays Alibaba. Love it. Yes. Yep. Uh, and, and of course, as, as fans of, of my other shows know, uh, Malachi Throne is known for being in really good two-part stories, whether it's a two-part Star Trek story or a two-part Six Million Dollar Man story. So I'm expecting <laughs> this to be a good two-part Electra Woman and Dinah Girl story. Yeah, this will be good. Yep. So that's coming up along with all the other great episodes. As I say, I'm back I'm recording. We've got Robert Long and I handling Some Days You Can't Get Rid of a Bomb. we got the Filmation 77. We've got Monster Squad. We've got Dan Greenfield and I handling Batman 66 Comics. And Jim Beard and I taking on the Batman 40 serials. And they're all coming up here on the Batcave Podcast. Folks, have yourselves a great new year. And thanks so much for listening. Until next time, Kevin, everyone, take care. See you next week on the really cool Croft Super Show. Don't get left behind. Take a trip with us today. We will lead you to a land of dreams. Croft has some super shows. They will blow your mind.
Thanks for listening, chums. I don't have a back phone, but you can contact the Batcave Podcast through its Facebook page, Twitter, email at thebatcavepodcast at gmail.com. Subscribe to the podcast via Lipson.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Or through iTunes. The Batcave Podcast is part of a series of pop culture podcasts from the Chronic Rift Network. Find them at chronicrift.com. So until next time, citizens, same bat time, same bat cave podcast. Super Shock. Super